In Gadget, Past is Future, you take the role of a government agent working under the brutal authoritarian reign of a dictator named Paolo Orlovsky. Currently, a comet on a crash course with the planet is fast approaching. Or at least, that's the information that a group of seven government scientists who have recently defected have leaked to the media. This news is causing social unrest within the nation and loosening Orlovsky's iron grip on the masses. Your task now is to track down the leader of these traitors scientists whose name is ho what horse lover frost what the hell yeah okay horse lover frost really takes the wind out of this dramatic introduction i was going for here this name is actually a reference to horse lover fat the alter ego of science fiction author philip k dick from his 1981 novel valis so it's not entirely without precedent Anyway, the smiling clerk at the hotel desk has your ticket, and a retro-futuristic train is waiting for you at the station. Where will it take you on your mission to track down your target, Horse Lover Frost? My god. Gadget, past as future, is a dark, desolate, surreal fever dream of a game. But even compared to other point-and-click adventures, Gadget is less a game and more of an interactive movie. Though some may scoff at the lack of player agency on display here, Gadget's allure lies in its dreamlike atmosphere and the ways in which it pulls you through its disjointed, logic-defying narrative. Gadget Past His Future also isn't actually the original version of Gadget. This is an enhanced port of an earlier game titled Gadget Invention Travel and Adventure. Both are first-person point-and-click adventure games developed by Synergy Inc., with Invention Travel and Adventure originally releasing for Mac and FM Towns platforms in Japan on November 28, 1993. This was followed by North American releases by Cryo Interactive for Mac and Windows in 1994. Japan then got their their own Windows release in 95, and there was even an Apple Pippin version released in Japan in 1996. For those who don't know, the Pippin was this hybrid game console slash multimedia device that came out in 1996 and was discontinued the following year, only managing to sell about 42,000 units during its short time on store shelves. Much like the 3DO, Apple designed the Pippin not as a piece of Apple exclusive hardware, but as a set of specifications to be licensed out to third parties. So any company that bought into it could then create their own branded devices under the Pippin name. I guess Apple wasn't paying much attention to how hard the 3DO was failing, or in their hubris, they just thought they could make that model work better. I don't have the faintest idea what I'm talking about. Whatever their intentions, the Pippin was an almost instant disaster, and Gadget, Invention, Travel, and Adventure was one of the few releases for the platform. Aside from that Pippin version, Gadget was met with relatively positive feedback from critics. Many were enthralled by the title's surreal atmosphere and advanced for the time, 3D rendered graphics. Gadget was created by graphic artist Haruhiko Shono, who first found cult success in the computer software space with his point-and-click adventure title Alice, an interactive museum, released in Japan in 1991 for Mac and Windows. In Alice, players navigate through a strange museum, interacting with exhibits and artifacts that are based loosely on elements from Lewis Carroll's classic children's novel Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Made up entirely of surreal artwork and demonstrations of the sound and video capabilities of computers of the time, you really have to place yourself back in the mindset of a computer owner in 1991 to get what the purpose of something like this is. Like many early multimedia experiments, it's meant to be explored and marveled at. Maybe shown off to your friends to wow them with what your fancy new computer was capable of. And wowing people seemed to be exactly what Alice accomplished. Leaving many early 90s critics impressed with its mixed media presentation especially its use of 3D rendered artwork. In 1992, Shono followed up Alice with another first-person software showpiece, L-Zone. This time, he eschewed the use of illustrations and photographs and opted for a fully pre-rendered 3D world. The style here also points more toward the retro-future visuals that Shono would later develop in Gadget. In L-Zone, you explore a futuristic city, and, as with Alice and Interactive Museum, there's a lot of just walking around, clicking on random objects, and watching trippy visual and music presentations. 
And still, critics at the time found the title endearing, lauding its visual design, with Computer Gaming World writing that L-Zone is the embodiment of technological adventure in the future tense. Both Alice and Interactive Museum and L-Zone are curious oddities, relics of the early days of 3D graphics. They were made primarily as showpieces for the technology of the time, but they had an undeniable artistic flourish that made them fascinating to behold, so it's easy to understand why critics and players were so enthusiastic about them. From a preservation standpoint, I think they're both incredibly important pieces of interactive media, and their successes led designer Haruhiko Shono toward Gadget, his biggest and most fully realized piece of work yet. As mentioned, Gadget, Invention, Travel, and Adventure was originally released in 1993, and its moderate success both in Japan and abroad led to re-releases of his earlier works, and eventually led to 1997's Gadget, Past is Future, which is the version that's actually the topic of this video. Now, Past is Future isn't a sequel or anything, it's more like a remaster, or maybe a remake. Actually, I, I don't really know how to classify it. It's somewhere in between a remaster and a remake, I guess. Invention, travel, and adventure impressed people with its odd world and retro future presentation, but Shono and his team had to leave a lot of ideas on the cutting room floor due to technological and space limitations. So when it found success and got his other games re-released, he ended up being offered the chance to gussy up Gadget for current systems, and he jumped at the opportunity to fully realize his original ideas. At first, though, Synergy's plans were more restrained, only opting to update some of the lighting and three renders, along with colorizing some of the cutscenes that were left black and white in the first version. Once Shono and the team got to work tweaking things though, they decided to go all out, redesigning characters, adding more cutscenes, and finishing up and adding back in the cut content from the original release. This makes Past as Future the definitive version of Gadget. It sometimes comes with the subtitle, The Unabridged Version. It has upgraded visuals, moodier lighting, better sound and music, plus it has everything that Shono wanted in the game the first time around. This enhanced version saw Mac, Windows, and Sony PlayStation releases in Japan in 1997. The Mac and Windows versions got a European release in 1998, but unlike Invention, Travel, and Adventure, Past as Future did not receive a North American version. In 2011, though, it was made available worldwide for iOS devices, but it was delisted at some point, because I couldn't find it for download. I mean, I didn't go into the search expecting much. So much stuff from the late 2000s and early 2010s has been delisted from the App Store. But anyway, I'll be primarily focusing on the European Windows release of Gadget Past is Future. I played through both Invention, Travel, and Adventure and Past is Future for this video, and the only thing I can say that's better in the first release is the transitions are a bit snappier, but that's not a good enough reason to choose it over the Enhanced Edition. Gadget isn't available on digital storefronts and is abandonware as of the making of this video, but there's a really sweet website called Zom's Lair, which has packaged the complete edition of the game into one handy zip file. This includes both the original Invention, Travel, and Adventure, and Past is Future. The original runs in DOSBox, but Past is Future needs a program called PCMU to run, which emulates Windows 95 on modern machines. Aside from being able to play this game, you can also mess around a bit with a stripped down version of Windows 95, and just seeing that splash screen in the interface here made me super nostalgic. Nostalgic. Past as Future originally came on four CD-ROMs, so at certain points throughout the game you're prompted to swap discs, which is accomplished by pressing Control, Alt, and Page Down on your keyboard to go into windowed mode, then choosing CD-ROM from the top menu and navigating to the folder where the ISO files are kept. It may feel a bit clunky while you're doing all this, and I was afraid whenever I swap discs that the loading screen that pops up would end up crashing the program, but luckily it all works smoothly, and I didn't run into any issues playing through the entire game this way. This complete download package of Gadget also comes with several extras, like an art book, the game's soundtrack, and archived links to some old website that includes an interview with designer Haruhiko Shono, as well as a story synopsis and character introductions, among other things. You also get this 79-minute prequel video called Gadget Trips Mindscapes. Supposedly, this tells the story of how the dictator Paolo Orlovsky came into power, and some other details about the story leading up to the game's events, but honestly, it's just a mindful fuck of a thing. I sort of watched it skip through most of it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, it's cool and all, but it's really a test of patience, and unless you're really, really invested in this world. There's no dialogue, which makes the scenes even more cryptic than those in the game, and I didn't even think that was possible. The 
There are also several just psychedelic freakout moments, including one near the end that lasts almost 15 minutes and makes the light show sequence near the end of Stanley Kubrick's 1968 film 2001 A Space Odyssey seem like a perfectly reasonable length of time for a scene like that. Even so, I'm glad they included all of these extras in the zip. If you want to download it for yourself, there's a link in the description below. One of the things not included in this download, though, is a tie-in novel called The Third Force, A Novel of Gadget, written by Mark Laidlaw and published in 1996, just before the release of Past as Future. Shortly after the novel's publication, Mark Laidlaw would go on to join Valve as lead writer for the Half-Life franchise, working on each Half-Life game up until Half-Life 2, Episode 2. He even contributed story ideas and writing to the cancelled Half-Life 2, Episode 3, which he stated in an interview was intended to be the end of the Half-Life 2 story arc, and we're all still waiting for that, I guess. When you first start up Gadget Past is Future, a flashy new intro cinematic that wasn't available in the original introduces us to the bleak, dreamlike tone and setting of the game. The fever doesn't go away. A numbness lingers. It's all over now. The scientists broke off contact. No news about the comet. Still feverish. From the beginning on, never moved a step. Nothing at all is beginning. So who's Slow Slope? No way of knowing now. Oh yeah, the cutscene will just loop like this until you click the screen and reveal the start button. This is a minor thing, but it was kind of jarring the first time I started the game. I thought the cutscene would lead into a menu, but nope. You just keep watching it over and over again until you click. After that, we exchange the dreamlike music for more cacophonous fare as a train races into a station and reveals the title sequence. Finally, we get this shot that starts from outside a building, enters said building through a window, and flies around a room before finally settling on our character's starting position. Nice little demonstration of the game's graphical engine, and something that wasn't possible for the team to do in the original release of Gadget. So here we are, standing in room 306 of the West End Hotel. On the desk nearby is a room key and a notebook with a single scrawled note. 0800 West End Hotel. S slow slop. Slow slop. 
Oh, these names are a treat. Turning on the nearby radio, we can listen to a news report about an approaching comet. This is a flash news report. Sometime before dawn this morning, scientists at the National Observatory sighted a comet, which is now fast approaching the center of the solar system. The comet passed above Pluto's orbit yesterday and is heading towards Earth. Efforts have been initiated at the observatory to determine the comet's exact orbit, and a study of possible countermeasures has been scheduled. Well, we got our key and notebook, so let's head out. Jesus! Is that all you do? Just stand with your face right up against my closed door waiting for me to open it to scare the shit out of me? Alright, fine, I'll go get the suitcase. It's in the bathroom for some reason. After grabbing it and plopping the notebook inside, Okay, that guy's gone. In this entrance area, there's a different guy sitting in a chair in the middle of this foggy room with red curtains, who says, It's okay. There's no sign of activity yet. <laughs> okay, buddy. I'll see you in the red room. <laughs> Across the hall is a door ajar with a large machine inside, but if you attempt to investigate, a man appears and tells you to beat it. The rest of the hotel rooms are inaccessible, so the only thing to do is head down the hall to the elevators. Well, I think I'd rather take the stairs. Uh, hello, young fellow. You seem to have the same suitcase as me. Uh, I, I guess this one is mine then. And, uh, oh, uh... Hey. Kids these days. When we reach the hotel's lobby, we see a man seated in a red velvet chair among a pack of other red velvet chairs. And let's just take a moment here to admire the composition of this shot. I love the lighting here. You're just immediately drawn to that raised platform where the man is seated. The diffused glow of the room lights illuminating the sharp red of the furniture. Pale daylight filtering through the square pattern of the window on the left. The foreground almost swallowed by inky shadow. I want this printed and framed on my wall. Like, it's so moody. I could live in this one image. As we approach, we see the rest of the lobby is empty, save for the bellhop blocking our exit. The man seated in one of the chairs is Slow Slop, our superior at whatever undefined branch of the government we work for. He informs us that our assignment is to make contact with the scientist Horse Lover Frost. A photo on the table depicts a group of seven scientists. Horse Lover is the third man from the left. The others are several of his colleagues, whom we'll also run across during our travels. After placing the photo in our suitcase, which has now become a briefcase somehow, we apparently swapped cases with that creepy kid in the elevator, Slow Slope tells us Horse Lover is currently at the museum and we should head there by train. Sometime during our conversation with Slow Slope, a clerk has appeared at the front desk. And, uh, look at this guy. Exactly the kind of person you want to see when you're booking a stay at a hotel. Another amazingly moody image, though, worthy of wall adornment. He has a train ticket just for us, and interacting with it sees us traveling to the train station where our ticket winds up in the hand of a different man at the ticket counter. These kinds of whirlwind, out-of-body travel sequences will happen frequently throughout Gadget, and they're just another way that Gadget takes control out of the player's hands. In the case of most other games, this would probably be a criticism, but as we'll come to see, Gadget does everything in its power to leave the player feeling, well, powerless. You interact with other characters who speak to you, but you have nothing to say in return. There are no dialogue options or even alternative paths to how you accomplish your objectives. At one point, as you're about to complete one of your tasks, a character nearby even tells you not to ask any questions and just do as you're told. You are playing as a lowly government employee, after all. Your purpose is to follow instructions, carry out orders, no questions asked. There are other story reasons given for this lack of player agency as well, but we'll get into those later. But yeah, gameplay wise, you'll be doing nothing more than clicking to explore the environment, clicking on characters to speak with them, clicking on items to pick them up and put them in your briefcase, or clicking on specific spots to place those items from your briefcase. Gadget does the rest of the work, whisking you from location to location. As we interact with the ticket in the hand of the hotel clerk, we're taken on a short tour outside to the train station across the plaza. There's a definite Eastern Bloc inspired look and feel to the surroundings, as if that wasn't to be expected 
distracted from the fact that the dictatorial leader of this unnamed nation is Orlovsky. This large plaza with its ironwork sculptures and red star iconography definitely gives off a Cold War era inspired machine-like flavor. The stations and other places that you'll visit have a large overbearing emptiness to them. There are a lot of early 3D games that have this kind of overall style. In most cases it's mainly because of the technical limitations. Polygons cost a lot of real estate in the processing power of early PCs, so many 3D games of the era have an uncanny starkness to their environments. But the best of these early games work that limitation into their world design, and it's clear that's what Gadget is doing. You're made to feel small in these huge, cavernous buildings. There's very little time spent in any outdoor environments, and even those are desolate and unwelcoming. The dearth of other people in these places also lends to that overall feeling. You'll often see just one person sitting alone among a bench at the far end of a large, uninviting station platform, and you'll quickly click through the two or three transition screens that it takes to reach them, only to be left with some cryptic line of dialogue related to your own mission, or given a piece of information that you already know, like the train is departing soon. Looking at the locations in Gadget, liminal spaces could be something that pops into your mind. What's more liminal and transitory than a train station, especially one devoid of people? Gadget's unnerving quality arises from this emptiness. You never feel comfortable. You never feel like you've arrived anywhere that you're supposed to be. In fact, you never do. Sometimes the train stops at a station, not the one you're meant to be at, but the main character will get off anyway and there's nothing to actually do. You just end up talking to one of the only characters also in the area who will tell you, the train is departing soon. It's weird and jarring. You feel like, why even have these moments? But then, they also feel strangely essential to the overall mood of confusion that the game constantly bombards you with. Pretty much every location in Gadget ends up feeling this way because of how empty and forlorn everything appears. It's very unsettling. It's also not called Gadget for nothing, as you'll be using and interacting with several devices that have a distinct retro-future aesthetic to them. There are giant contraptions with overcomplicated controls featuring tons of dials, switches, and levers that have functions beyond our understanding. Even the menu screen has a bunch of trinkets and knickknacks unrelated to the various functions of the game menu. You can click to interact with them, they don't do anything aside from creep you out most of the time, and they change with every disc of the game. It's completely superfluous, but it's interesting that the bizarre atmosphere of the game extends even to its menu design. When you eventually make it to the museum, your first destination in the story, you can spend time exploring the pieces on display, which are all various machines and components. An old-fashioned circulating fan, speakers, mixers, a cash register, even an old real-style camera that looks like the one we saw falling in the opening cutscene. The way all of these items are arranged recalls pieces dug up from old archaeological digs on display, like the curators weren't quite sure of their functions and whether or not they related to each other in any meaningful way. Then, of course, there are the stars of Gadget's world, the trains. Travel is one of the major themes of Gadget, if that wasn't already apparent in the original subtitle, Invention, Travel, and Adventure. There are a few other forms of transportation besides trains that you'll find yourself riding in, but the trains are omnipresent, and your central form of travel. Fitting for a game that was created in Japan, a country that thrives on its efficient public transportation system, largely in the form of trains. For those who maybe aren't aware, I live in Japan have lived here for over 10 years, and I've ridden my fair share of Japan Rail and Tokyo Metro lines. I've been on the Yamanote line at rush hour, crushed within the ever-flowing humanity of a populace in transition. I've also sat on outbound lines, with near peopleless carriages swaying softly to the quiet trundling of the wheels on the tracks, and in certain moments have accidentally caught the gaze of another dead-eyed passenger during our own much emptier state of shared travel. <laughs> Geez, okay, let's talk about these people, why don't we? They're terrifying. In real life, yes, but let's stick to the characters and gadgets specifically. Much like the empty locations of the game world owing to the crudeness of early 3D, the characters here also have an uncanny, artificial appearance. The shadows and dim lighting that you find most of them bathed in don't help anyone look more human. As with the jump cuts that take us through to different viewpoints around the places that we explore, characters also move with jumpy, still image style movement. Whenever you interact with someone, they do this horror movie-esque turn toward you. Only the turn itself is missing, and instead their heads just 
jump from one position to looking right at you, which makes it even more unsettling. Every movement is so abrupt. Our main character here seems to be a close talker, too, because he loves getting right up in the faces of these freaky cadaver people. As you move through your mission, you'll meet several of the other scientists that you saw in the photo from the hotel lobby. They've joined Horse Lover in his defection, and often show up to direct you toward their leader's current location and urge you to work with him. Other characters, such as the passengers you'll meet on the trains, either worry about the comet's approach or think that the whole thing is a hoax perpetrated by the rogue scientists. Some have tiny subplots, like a doctor you first meet on the train who tells you he's searching for an escaped mental patient. He gives you a description of the man, beady-eyed with a handlebar mustache, and also warns you that he's a real pervert. Later, you meet a man fitting that description in one of the stations. When you approach to speak with him, though, he introduces himself as a police detective and talks about how Horse Lover is a revolutionary agitating the other scientists. He wants you to give him any information you can about his whereabouts. As you run into this guy throughout your journey, he changes his story slightly, next telling you that he's with the Imperial Special Forces. Finally, he just starts making up organizations that he belongs to. What a pervert. Speaking of perverts, there's also this dude who just starts blabbing to you about his STD. Electricity shot down my spine, and when I was numb from top to toe, a purplish rash came out on my thighs and groin. Dude, I don't even know you. You'll run into this guy several times along the way too, and his confessional here actually starts to make more connections to the main story than it at first seems to. Then there's the guy who starts out as just a doubter of the scientist's claims that a comet is approaching Earth, but eventually ends up thirsty for vengeance and wanting to torture Horse Lover and his followers. What a pervert. There's very little voice dialogue throughout the game. Outside of the opening cutscene, the main character never utters a single line of speech. The only other character who talks throughout the whole thing is Slow Slop, but only during the couple of times that he rings you up on a public phone to give you new instructions. Slow Slop here. The situation's changed. I have something else I want you to do for me. Horse Lover's got six people under him. You've got the photographs I gave you of those scientists, right? I want you to keep them under surveillance. Give me reports on what they're researching and why. I'll get in touch with you again later. <coughs> Whenever you meet him in person, his speech only appears in text. And weirdly, the voice moments in the game don't have any subtitles, which is kind of annoying. The music in Gadget is generally understated during exploration sequences, quietly underpinning the other sound effects that make up most of the ambience. As we saw during the title cutscene though, things can build to a cacophonous level with dissonant tones and competing elements filling out a wall of sound. The short track that plays whenever a train departs or enters a station has this drum march to it that makes you feel like you're on your way to work. It's the sound of industry in motion. There are also more unnatural tracks during the psychedelic freakout moments of the story. The music was composed by Koji Ueno. Throughout the early parts of his career in the 80s, he was part of an avant-garde musical group known as Guernica, named after the 1937 painting by Pablo Picasso. Guernica used a mix of pianos and orchestral sounds punctuated with plenty of dissonance and the dramatic vocal stylings of Jun Togawa. There's a full concert on YouTube if you just search Guernica Japanese Band. It's pretty awesome. And according to Wikipedia, the band used a lot of futurist, communist, and fascist aesthetics. It's no small wonder why Haruhiko Shono contacted Ueno to work on his vaguely Cold War era inspired retro futurist interactive media project. Ueno's sound fits the atmosphere of Gadget like a glove, and again, past as future only strengthens the aural presentation. The rest of Gadget's soundscape is generally very quiet and ambient. 
You'll hear the hum of unknown machinery or the buzzing of lights in indoor areas, like the hotel or the museum. The stations have an echoey emptiness to them with various train sounds filling the rest of the space. On the trains themselves, the quiet trundling of the wheels on the tracks lulls you into a meditative vibe as you wander through the carriages, sometimes even catching a glimpse of the scenery passing by when you look out certain windows. I'm going to talk more about the game's story now, so if you want to experience Gadget on your own, skip to this time, or click on the conclusion section of the chapter select to move on to my final thoughts about the game. I'll warn you, I don't really have a firm grasp on a lot of the reasons why things are happening in Gadget, even after playing through it twice, but I can tell you what happens in the game. As you're pulled along through Gadget's narrative on your mission to track down Horse Lover, you'll run across several of his associates. The first will be Charles Reef, a researcher studying the effects of electromagnetic waves on the human body. You find him in one of the back rooms of the museum, standing next to a giant contraption called a Sensorama. You actually saw him right in the beginning of the game, just outside of your hotel room, sitting alone in the middle of an empty room. I don't know why. Charles tells you the machine was originally used as a therapeutic device, however, the scientists have added refinements and now use it to develop latent powers. He then says, hey, why don't you start her up, which your character just goes ahead and does because he listens to everything everyone tells him to do. This is the first of several psychedelic freakout visions in the game. Whether or not this actually awakens any latent power within the protagonist is unclear. After coming out of the machine's hypnotic vision, George informs you that sometimes this one short circuits. They're still working on it. Thanks, buddy. Later on, in an encounter with a character whom I mentioned earlier, he states that people exposed to the Sensorama's electromagnetic waves end up becoming slaves to Horse Lover. According to him, the scientists who work with Horse Lover have already had their Sensorama baptism and have become true believers in the comet's approach. He warns you not to pay attention to what they say. But then there are also references to the Sensorama being used by the government to punish people. Perhaps this is what Charles was referring to when he said the machine was originally used for therapeutic purposes. There are no solid answers about the Sensorama, of course, but you will run across a few of them throughout Gadget, and the main character will take his own Sensorama baptism several times. It's hard to tell which of these machines are scientist-altered or government-issued, though. At one point later on, you find a briefcase on a table in the train's dining car. Inside is a Sensorama test sheet, showing photos of those who have undergone Sensorama experiments at the West End Hotel. They're all passengers you've run across, either on the train or in the various stations around the city, and they're all marked as failed. The West End Hotel is where we started our journey, and didn't we see a machine in the room across the hall? In the beginning, we didn't know what it was, but now... Through meeting with several of Horse Lover's associates, you find out that the scientists have a plan to build a spaceship, an Ark apparently, to escape Earth before the comet hits. It won't be able to save everyone, but it will at least allow a few to escape. They're refining fuel from parts of meteors that have been showering Earth in the lead-up to the comet's approach, and this refined fuel affords them a near-infinite power source. What the end goal of this escape is, even the scientists don't know. One of them even says that they have no goal, they'll just continue to travel until the fuel runs out. You eventually meet up with Horse Lover Frost in the National Observatory, where he allows you to look through the telescope there and see proof of the comet, hanging ominously in space, looking like Sephiroth's meteor summon from Final Fantasy VII. You also learn that your superior, Slosloth, is actually on the side of the scientists. He sent you as a sign for the scientists to begin work on the Ark. If you cooperate, Horse Lover will offer you a spot on the Ark when they make their escape. But first, they need to test a prototype at a place called the Arsenal, a government facility only accessible by a special train called the Nova Express. When you arrive, you place several components you've been collecting all along into various devices at the instruction of the other scientists. Then you enter the prototype Ark to begin the testing phase. This involves pulling levers and flipping various switches inside the cockpit, traveling through an underground maze extremely similar to the maze 
new sequence near the end of Mist, it sucks just as much too. And eventually ending with you flying the Ark back to the National Observatory. Slow Slop is waiting for you and asks you to hand over your briefcase, which of course you do. The observatory begins to light up, acting as a beacon. Slow Slope says the mothership is now in position. Then he tells you the mothership will come to take them away as the comet is approaching and Earth's destruction is imminent. Then he blows up? Afterwards, you're left alone in the observatory, but the young boy appears. This kid's actually been appearing and disappearing at several points throughout the story, always looking creepy as hell and sometimes even floating around like a goddamn freak. Following him inside brings you to a flooded hallway that bears a striking resemblance to the hotel hallway from the beginning of the game. A man, also the one from the beginning of the game, is standing in the hall near an open door and inside is another Sensorama device. You enter a bathroom, again, similar to the one found in your hotel room in the beginning of the game, and you have no reflection. No problem, you didn't have a reflection in the first place. But if you spin around, you see the boy in the mirror, which then shatters, revealing the comet in space and a gnarled tree. Back in the room behind you, you see Slow Slop and Horse Lover conversing. They slowly turn to look at you. Oh my god, that's disturbing. Before disappearing into mist, and now you're actually back in the hotel. As you sit down to use the sensorama, it disappears. Slow Slop and another man, who appears to be Paolo Orlovsky himself, are now standing in the room. Orlovsky says that he chooses the guinea pigs, and you're no exception. They're ready for all-out war. Army trains speed across the plains. Spy planes fly on high. Reactionaries nipped in the bud. Disobey and your brain gets washed. He will not fail to make the sensorama work. The one and perfect will. Complete and total power. After this vision, you're back in the hotel room and the sensorama is there. Out the window, a bright light grows and fades. Then that creepy little kid is behind you again, and once again does nothing but just fade away. Back towards the window, a jungle-like background has appeared outside with several lights circling. Still feverish. From the beginning on, never moved a step. Nothing at all is beginning. So who's Slow Slope? No way of knowing. Psychorama show is about to start. Bell should ring pretty soon. Blinding lights spin round. An image flickers into view and out. No matter how the scenery changes, no matter the character's mutterings, if a fuse blows and the power fails, in that instant, it all melts into purpose. So what is the actual truth in Gadget? Were the scientists telling the truth? That a comet was approaching Earth? Or was it all a lie to find a test subject for their prototype arc so they could escape the ruthless control of an authoritarian government? Or could it have all just been a test by the government to weed out dissent among its very employees? The main character narrates, both in the beginning and at the end of the game, that nothing at all began, that he never moved a step, that he doesn't even know who Slow Slop is. The last images are conflicting. A rain of fire falls down on a barren swampland with trains and other structures broken down and rusted. Then what seems to be maybe fragments of a comet breaking through the atmosphere turns into the lights of a giant ship. The Ark? The Sensorama rises from the swamp. We see the little boy, then see him submerged in the waters, at last settling on a pale green light, like the light from the Sensorama breaking through the branches of the trees. 
Maybe in the end you were only a guinea pig, used in the Sensorama experiments, under the control of either Horse Lover or the government. Who can say? Does it really matter which? Your own agency and free will were long ago stripped away from you in a flash of electromagnetic brilliance. Overall, Gadget is a game about control. The fictional government's control over this nation, the scientists' supposed control over the means of escaping the real or make-believe comet's destruction, the game designer's control over the ebb and flow of events, and your own lack of control as you follow the orders of others, shuffled through the different beats of this bizarre story. You travel back and forth on this city's only train line, never winding up where you need to be, constantly retracing your path, heading forwards, then back, until you don't really know what way is forward and what way is back anymore. You're only briefly able to break from the train's singular line and fly before you're brought back down, arriving again at a destination that was predetermined for you. The people that you meet either speak in riddles and nonsense, driven mad by experiments or by the very nature of this world itself, or they speak very succinctly, giving you direct instructions as to where you're to go, who you're to meet, and what you're to do next. Much like the transportation you ride and the gadgets you interact with, you two are nothing but a cold tool. You have no agency, you have no mouth, and you must scream. <laughs> it's a bleak, discomforting, and desolate world, full of characters of the same descriptors, with music that's industrial, rhythmic procession marches you onward into the absurdity. What does it all mean? Like many games, books, movies, music of this kind, it doesn't really matter, does it? Haruhiko Shono's focus in every piece of software he designed was giving the person interacting with it an experience along with a demonstration of what digital art was capable of. I'm not one to really linger on the debate of whether or not games are art. If you think so, great. If you don't, great. If you think Gadget looks like a cool thing to check out, great. If you want to try to argue in the comments about how this isn't a game, great. If you want to tell me how I suck at coming up with endings to my videos, great. And that's Gadget, past is future. Thanks for watching. If you're still hanging out, you can like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube stuff. I want to give a special thanks to Nazaru Japanese brand nasal spray for helping me through this allergy season and making it so I did not sound like I got punched in the nose while recording this voiceover. When I was practicing the read through, it was terrible. I didn't know if I'd be able to even record, but tingly nose medicine got me through. I also want to thank the dungeon. Oh my God, Zoe, what? Yes, okay. That was my Shih Tzu Zoe mad at me that I wasn't paying attention to her. Uh, I'm almost done. Uh, I also want to thank the dungeon dwellers here on screen for donating monthly to my Patreon and through uh, YouTube memberships too. You're all fantastic. If you're watching this ending bit and you like what I do here with these videos, please consider donating. Uh, you not only get your names in the videos, but you also get to watch them a day or two early. I make them unlisted and post the link on Patreon and through members-only posts on YouTube. Uh, I always write a little blurb about making the video, and I usually give updates on future videos. And there are also polls to vote on upcoming videos. Patrons and YouTube members actually just voted on the next two videos I'll be covering, and they're going to be Baroque for Saturn and Haunting Ground for PS2. I'm going to do more polls throughout this year and into the future, so if you want to get in on that action, link to the Patreon is in the description, and there's a join button somewhere on this video page for a YouTube membership. If you donate $5 or more, you get your name read out loud at the end of videos like these, Dungeon Architects, Antichrist Alex, Benefer94, David Carr, Goats and Goblins, Glen Haven, Half HP, High Food Court, Izzy Lexus, Joshua Ayers, Justin Darnell, Kyowa, Lunar Vale, Nekot the Brave, Nick Wolf, Richard Cutting, Shannon Gates, Stefano Urenya, and White Like Eyes, as well as these dungeon connoisseurs, Adon, Alfred Correa, Anjan01, Bunzo, Cherm Slurm, Chiral Spiral, Crassus Zero, Crippler Jones, Dazed Clockwork, Dika Diko, Glitterthroat, Hokun Buyum, Hope I pronounced that right. I, I looked it up before recording this, but I probably butchered it. Indigo Happy, Irregular Rob, J Butt Airline, Gemma, Jet Daddy, Jogoth Ur, Joshua Weber, Liana, Macrophage, Minced Meat, Mr. Independent, Nicholas Postar, Noel the Monkey, Old Dead Lemons, Olaf Albine, Please Keep Making Videos, Pretty Cody, Prince Goof, Rainbows 98, Rez, Ribbon Black, Sable, Samuel Pandiangan, Samurai85X, 
Slowbro96, Solar, T, True Axiom, Tuesday Twin, TV's Brent, Warrior Song, Where Am I, Help, and Zach Diedrich. Thank you all for your support. Thank you once again for watching. I'll catch you in the next one. For now, Gadget, Past is Future. Check it out. Dungeon Chill, out. <laughs>